This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah. Bismillah. Walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank him, we praise him, we glorify him. We beseech him to send his choicest salutations upon his most beloved sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. So for those of you who have been joining us at some of these gatherings over the last weeks, we were meeting on Saturdays before iftar. Uh, and today I'm also covering for this night. Uh, and we were looking at an excerpt from a text called Ayyuh al-Walid by Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, who is one of the foremost thinkers, intellectuals, scholars of our tradition, uh, and has a lot of amazing insight when it comes to Islam as a religion on a whole. I was thinking as we're now approaching the tail end of Ramadan, may Allah accept it from us and make it a means of continued blessing and benefit for us, that we would look at the counsels of another spiritual master of our tradition by the name of Dhunun al-Misri, rahimahullah. And Dhunun al-Misri, rahimahullah, he is considered to be one of the most important figures of spirituality within Islam as a religion. He was more engaged and prolific in uh, the early part of the 800s. And so we're quite distant from him in terms of just time, but where and how he impacts so many even today, his counsels, his wisdoms, his insights are things that I would definitely recommend people look into. Again, his name is Dhunun al-Misri. If you were to transliterate that, It would be D-H-U-L-N-U-N Al-Misri, A-L-M-I-S-R-I. One of the interesting things about the Nun Al-Misri before we go into one of his particular councils is that when people describe him, they describe him by his full name Al-Misri, meaning that he is of Egypt, of Misr. But in his depictions and what he looks like, we are told that the Nul al-Misri is somebody who is Nubian, he's black. And it's not meant to be a tangent, but something for us to think about that we have a deep legacy of the experience of those who self-identify as black as being a part of the foundations of this religion. And I want us to be able to understand this because one, we wanna be able to understand just who it is that we read when we're reading them, right? Like Imam Ghazali, he had a life. The Nul al-Misri, he had a life. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has a life. When we read the prophetic biography, it's not so that we have a Sunday school knowledge or trivia knowledge, but we are understanding a lot of different gains from his life But also when we get an insight into who he was, it informs us now a little bit more as we draw from his words and the narrations that are left behind of him. Just like if you're gonna quote Malcolm X, you are going to quote any prolific figure that has existed. These are people that have actual experiences. And so we don't wanna just copy paste their text or read it in an eisegetical manner that we now turn it into what it is that is relevant for us or our purposes, but we wanna draw meaning from it and to understand and contextualize who they were, where they lived. And this man, the Noon al-Misri rahimahullah, who has impacted individuals across generations, it's important to understand because it's something that gets left behind for many of us that he was somebody who was a black man. And it wasn't that he was an oddity or a rarity, but he was amongst many individuals who 
we're not just those who were adding to the experience of Islam or they came later on, but Islam is something that is rooted and built upon very different individuals from various backgrounds, including those who self-identify as Black. And that shift in racial understanding comes at some point likely heavily influenced by colonization, supremacy, a lot of different things that we find in our collective shared history. Hajar, peace be upon her, is left at the well of Zamzam. We all probably know the story, but just to go into it for those who might not, that Ibrahim, the prophet Abraham, is commanded to take his son Ismail and his wife Hajar, peace be upon them all, to the deserts, and they're left there with just some dates and water. And as she is asking him why he's doing this, he doesn't respond until she says, Allahu amraka bihada, that has God commanded you with this. And when he says yes, she, like many others, has been Allahu wa ni'mal wakil, that Allah is sufficient for me. He is the disposer of my affairs. I put my trust in God. I know he's not going to put me in a place that's difficult for me to handle. And so they are left at the deserts, and Ismail is kicking at the desert sand with his blessed feet, and Hajar is running from the hills of Safa and Marwa, and she now is at the summits of them. And Ismail, where his feet are kicking, the angel comes and strikes the ground. The well of Zamzam spurts forward, water's going everywhere. Hajar, peace be upon her, seeks to contain it. And the Prophet says in a hadith later that may Allah have mercy on Hajar, had she not sought to contain the water of Zamzam, it would have dispersed and covered the entire earth. And now where the water is, the birds start to flock into the desert where this oasis has been established. And there's a tribe called the Jurham tribe that sees these birds going where they know there to be nothing. So they send some of their emissaries to see why are birds going where there's nothing. And to their astonishment, not only do they see this large body of water and this young child and this elderly woman, where they thought there would be nothing. And so they engage her in conversation and ask if they can settle there. And she says, yes, but the water is under my ownership. I decide what happens with this well. And they agree. And the Jorham settle, and this is where the city of Mecca gets established. There's a couple of things you want to understand from this. One, Sharia literally translates to a path to water. And the idea is that water becomes a source of life, a source of invigoration. It's meant to be expansive, not restrictive, right? The birds are flying to the water. It's calling you to sustenance. It's meant to invigorate you. That's what Sharia is supposed to do. It's not just something that's a set of do's and don'ts that gets you nowhere. But for the purpose of our conversation, Hajar, peace be upon her, is a black woman. And this tribe of Arab men are engaging her now in conversation. And not only are they engaging her in conversation, they agree to what it is that she's setting as a parameter. The well is mine. And so the shift in gender, the shift in race, we want to reclaim a paradigm shift and to recognize that we are part of a religion <clears throat> that is based off of principles of inclusivity. The jamia is another word for masjid, and the, the word jamia also means inclusive, comprehensive, universal. And inclusivity is not just about tokenized diversity, that we got brown people and white people and black people and young people and old people and men and women and people who are rich and poor and everything in between as check boxes. But inclusivity is about valuing the people who are present and you value them for who it is that they are. And so the Noon al-Misri, rahimahullah, a great spiritual master of our tradition, he who has impacted numerous spiritual masters in our tradition, he's a black man.
And may Allah bless him for all that he has contributed to our tradition. And I want you to know this because there's such a rich history and legacy. And we need to start naming this in this way so that we can understand and address what might become obstacles within us, but also so that we can understand who it is that we're reading and what it is that we're learning from. So one of the councils that I believe is very relevant to our leaving Ramadan, may Allah make us those who carry forth the lessons of this month into every tomorrow that we see in this world. That the Noon al-Misri, he speaks about in this particular council, uh, a concept in our spiritual tradition that's called the Qaswatul Qalb, that Allah speaks about this in the Quran as well. It's a hardening of the heart. And may Allah grant us hearts that are soft and tender. And you want to juxtapose this, right? Hardness in our tradition means a heart. That's not the kind of heart you want to have, right? There's a hadith where the Prophet wasallam he says, Inna lillahi ta'ala aniyatan min ahlil ard. That indeed for Allah, there are vessels amongst the ahlil ard, the people of the earth. وَآنِيَةُ رَبِّكُمْ قُلُوبُ إِبَادِهِ الصَّالِحِينَ And the vessels of your Lord are the hearts of His righteous servants. أَحَبُّهَا أَلْيَنُهَا وَأَرَكُهَا The ones He loves the most are those that are most light, those that are most soft and most gentle, most tender. May Allah grant us hearts that are like this. So the terminology that we want to understand is a terminology that's embedded within this lexicon and this genre of engagement. The hard heart is being juxtaposed to a soft heart. And the soft heart that we seek to aspire towards having is a heart that our tradition teaches us to have. A heart that is soft, that is lean, for example, is one that is willing to take advice. Right? It's really easy to give advice, but it's really bitter to take advice. And may Allah make us those who have hearts that are lean, right? Hearts that are soft, hearts that are willing to be molded and malleable. But today we're going to talk about the qaswatul qalb because the hardness of the heart becomes something now that is attached to things that might be directly the cause of our actions. If you lie, if you gossip, if you backbite, God forbid, these are going to make your heart harder. We can also find difficulty and challenge within our hearts, strenuousness, because we live in a society that worships the ego. So supremacy is a modern day shirk that idolizes the self, the nafs. And being in Ramadan, you've now been in a place where you're away from shaitani thoughts and you have now the ability to engage the nafsani thoughts, we talked about this a little yesterday, right? In spirituality, in Islam, thoughts are categorized as four, the khawatir. You have rabbani thoughts, thoughts that are given straight from God, they're just good. Malakani thoughts, angelic, celestial thoughts. These are kind of thoughts that teach you to greet people you know or you don't know, or to sit and make your dua and to pray your sunnahs, or to give in charity or to visit the sick. You then have nafsani thoughts, the kind of thoughts that say, just get up after you're done praying. Don't engage in stillness or reflection. Something else is more important that's calling your heart towards you. Don't greet people. Don't smile at people. Somebody else will give the salam. You don't have to be the one that calls the convert that's eating by themselves on Eid in a diner. You don't have to be the one that's checking in on the elder who is widowed and has no one to live with. Those are nafsani thoughts. Because the nafs is lazy, it doesn't want you to be generous. And then the fourth category are shaitani thoughts. May Allah protect us from them. And those are the ones that say, just do haram, what's the big deal? The impact now creates this hardness in our heart, the qaswatul qalb. And so Dhanun al-Misri, he gives us advices that are five that I think are relevant as we're looking to move forward from Ramadan. Because Ramadan, as many of you have heard me say before, it's not about empty stomachs, man. It's about full hearts. It's about reclaiming your heart. It's about being in a space where you make the heart sovereign. 
and you beat down the tyranny of the ego, the base desire, right? If you were to stand straight and look into a mirror, your physical body, the way Allah has designed us, literally the lower self of us is where our stomachs and our sexual organs are the higher part of us the upper body is where our heart and our mind is and what ramadan is teaching us is to literally yield to the higher self not the lower self you want to engage where the heart and the mind reside and not let the stomach and the sexual organs define and dictate decisions and so your physical body is an illustration of where it is you want to be focused on. And so the Noon al-Misri, he gives us now these counsels that I believe are relevant as we're moving from Ramadan. And individually, you want to think for yourself, like, what am I taking from this month, right? I'm assuming most of us on this call are not five years old or 15, right? We're older people right? In our late teens, 20s, 50s, 70s, whatever it is. But where we're at, we have intellectual capacity. And to get depth now and volume through contemplation and reflection, so that you can start to think about what you're taking from this month, because this month is about abandoning things, right? Tarak. But you don't want to abandon in a vacuum. You're abandoning so that you gain other stuff. And what you've gained, whether you're conscious of it or not, is growth in the taking care of what is the most precious part of you, which is your inside, not your outside. We live in a society that quite often teaches us to look at ourselves and not for ourselves. And our tradition teaches us to be present within ourselves and to let that presence and consciousness define how we move forward. That's what taqwa is. In modern parlance, it's mindfulness. You have an awareness, a sense of consciousness as you go through your decision making. And may Allah make us people of consciousness. And so the Noon al Misri, he says, that if you have a desire for the qaswatul qalb, for the hardness of your heart to go away, then his first advice, he says, siyam, then endure in siyam, in fasting. Some of us can't fast, and that's okay. And some of us can fast, and that's okay too. He's got five advices. Think about it now in its relevancy to you. When we talk about nafsani thoughts, the first thought that's going to come in of a nafsani thought rooted as a remnant of a shaitani thought is to look as to why something won't work, why something should be looked at in the prism of a negative, right? We think statistically 12,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. 80% of these are negative thoughts statistically. Upwards of 96% are repeat thoughts. So not only do we think four out of every five thoughts negatively, but we think also in a place where we're compounding them. And what you want to be is embracing, not just of the ability to think, because all of us can think, but you want to embrace the liberty of both choosing what you think about and how you think of the things that you're thinking about. And so I don't want you to think about, I got to fast more, I just fasted for a month, right? Or I can't fast at all. He's saying endure in fasting. That is the base element of our spiritual diet. Because a lot of what our spiritual diet revolves around is recognizing the balance of us as consumers versus contributors. And consumption is about what you eat as much as how much you eat, the quality of what you eat, what you drink, what you do not drink. But consumption is also about what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, all of your sensory organs of consumption. Think about the fast of Ramadan, but think about what Ramadan is also rendering to be inactive in its days and nights. 
And when you leave forward from Ramadan, what your Siyam is teaching you is how to regain the ability to say no to things. That you don't have to become now subservient to desire, to the stomach, to the physical. In our tradition, fasting has numerous forms. The companions were advised to fast the illuminated days of the month when the moon is at its fullest, the white days, the 13th, 14th, and 15th of the lunar calendar month. They were told to fast Mondays and Thursdays. They were told to fast every other day, as was the sunnah of the Prophet Dawood But what the Prophet is doing is going from a lesser number of days to a higher number of days. Because it's not about the quantity, but the quality of what you do. We have even thick opinions that say that you can fast every day other than the days it's haram to fast, like the days of Eid. But you build it in. You place into check the stomach and the feeding of the stomach and the feeding of the physical because it becomes a means of dilution of your consciousness. You think about where and how you have regained some aspect of control and self-restraint and the ability to say no. I want you to think about this now in the prisms of a few things. In the hadith, Allah is described by the Prophet wasallam. He says, In Allah Ta'ala Tayyib, La yaqbal illa tayyib. That indeed Allah Zawjal is pure and good, and He does not accept, except that which is pure and good. Tayyib, to be tayyib, good, is in contrast to being khabith, right? We have this word in Urdu and in Hindi as well, right? It's like not good, right? You do not want to be that. So you juxtapose this now. And what that tayyibness is, is in extreme contrast sometimes to what societally is deemed to be normative. And so there are certain things that one would say, well, why don't you just drink this? Why don't you just eat a third or a fourth or a fifth helping? Why do you need to go and volunteer at a soup kitchen? What's the point of it? The point is to reclaim this aspect of being tayyib, of wanting this quality of thieb, of goodness. And you root that now in a qualified understanding. Like, what am I eating? Where did it come from? Who is being oppressed in order for me to have to eat this? What are the wages of the employees that are there? We talked about this a little bit yesterday. We were looking at Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, and he was saying that the seventh benefit that Hatim took from Shakik al-Balqi was that he saw that People were just trying to get their sustenance from doubtful ways, from haram ways, because they just wanted more money and more money and more food, and they didn't care where it came from. And so a part of being conscious of what we put into our bodies is also ensuring that those who are at every aspect of that supply chain are being treated with honor and dignity. And that nobody has to be in a place where they are being forced to lower than substandard wages or being oppressed or have no rights as workers or that their lands are being usurped, right? We just bought a bunch of dates from Palestine. May Allah make things easy for the people of Palestine. There's people who take Palestinian farmers' dates, literally just take it from them throw a Made in Israel label on it, and then sell it to a lot of the stores that you buy dates from. And what they're doing is taking from their crop, not giving them what is due to them, and then profiting of it from your wealth. And then you eat that. And that is not what the spirit of fasting is. You have to have consciousness and awareness. So it's not just the food is on my plate and it just magically popped up there. And I think of quality as well as quantity. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said one third food, one third water, one third air, which means that you don't have to eat so much food, 
but you should be drinking as much water as you're eating food. And water is a beautiful thing to drink. And I'm not gonna say eat this much or don't eat this much. All of us have different body types. All of us have different relationships to food, but that's what it really comes down to. How do you relate to food? I had people ask me in the beginning of Ramadan, is it bad that I'm gonna try to use Ramadan to lose weight? And I said, no, man, I'm using Ramadan to lose weight. I got heavier than I've ever been in my life in the midst of COVID. I got on a scale, I don't know how many months ago, after not being on a scale for a long time, and it said I weighed a lot. And then I said, oh, this scale must be broken. And my eight-year-old Medina, mashallah, she got on the scale and weighed herself. She's like, no, Baba, it's perfectly fine. It says the right weight that I am. And when people are asking me, well, is it a problem that I utilize Ramadan in this way? For me, I could tell you that what I was using Ramadan for was to redevelop my relationship to my food and my eating habits. And that my health is what is the motivation of my physical exercise and my diets and this kind of stuff. And it's not about vanity, it's about health. And so a byproduct of Ramadan for me was that I was now trying to regain control of my nafs in a sphere where I change how I relate to food. And so the Noon al-Misri, he's saying, if you want to ensure that the hardness of your heart diminishes, then endure in fasting. Don't jump into indulgence at the end of the month. Don't go into a place where you lose now the dignity of humanity. We are the only part of creation that somehow, even when our stomachs are full, we still feed ourselves. May Allah protect us from this. But try to live hadith, for example, that say food for one is enough for two. Food for two is enough for four. And share your meals. Have barakah that distributes it. There's people right now in a lot of parts of New York City, they don't have anything to eat. There's people in a lot of different parts of the world who don't have anything to eat. May Allah make it easy for them. And so you think about this. If you have the ability to fast, then fast. Even if you cannot fast, think about consumption at a deeper level. What are the conversations you're having? Don't jump into conversations that are filled with gossip and backbiting and lying. We live in a time technologically where you can actually gossip without speaking to somebody. You don't need a person to gossip with. You can just write things. In our tradition, Someone is called kadhab when they lie, right? May Allah protect us from it. They tell untruths. You are called a kathib, which is different from kadhab. A kathib is someone who shares a story with only having heard one side of it and not verifying what the other side is. And it's real easy to retweet and share and all of this, and all of that's gonna still come up on a day of judgment. May Allah make it easy for us, right? So what you're consuming, don't listen to things with a lot of vulgar language. Don't listen to things or watch things that are purposely done to be devoid of what is tayyib, right? A lot of media is just lies at the end of the day. A lot of it is just filled with fallacies to generate ad revenues. These are things that are problematic. Fast in terms of what you're consuming overall. Then he continues and he says, that after you've endured in fasting, if you still find hardness in your heart, then he says, then make your standing longer, referring to the night prayer, the night vigil, the qiyam layl There's a companion of the Prophet وسلم, who comes and speaks to the Messenger of God asking for advice. And he says to him, Ya Abdullah, la tukun mithil fulan, kana yakumu layl, wa taraka kiyamu layl. That, oh, Abdullah, don't be like so and so and such and such. He used to stand in the night for prayer, and then he abandoned the night prayer, right? It's back to this word, tarak, wa taraka kiyamu layl. Then he abandoned the kiyamu layl, 
Ramadan is about abandoning things you're leaving behind, even what is permissible, eating and drinking, so that you gain other things. So a part of our spiritual increase is taking advantage of the hidden secrets of the night. And the irony is such that when the nights get to their darkest of shades, it creates the most opportunity for illumination of your inside. And you want to do this at a pace that makes sense for you. After you pray your Isha prayer, right? And step number one in this, and I say it with love, you got to pray your five daily prayers at the times that the prayers come in. You want to be on top of it, right? In our thick books, it's called Hurmul Waqt, the sanctity of the time. When the companions ask the Prophet, what is the best deed in Allah's eyes? He says that prayer on its time, and that means in its window of time. So get your fara'id done, and it's hard. I was in a place when I was younger where I struggled with praying all of my prayers. And I could tell you now as somebody who is on top of it, alhamdulillah, that it wasn't easy to build a relationship in a routine, but I don't regret where I came from because it helps me to appreciate more the sweetness of the prayer that I experience now. And it's not burdensome obligation that I want to stand with my God who loves me more than a mother loves his child. I want to be in communion with the divine. I want to be in relation with the divine who believes in me more than I even believe in myself. And so you start with your five daily prayers. And then you start to add to it. So you can pray Qiyamul Layl by even praying some rakahs right after you pray the Isha prayer, before you go to sleep. The last third of the night is where the most emphasis is, right? A lot of people last night, the 27th night, they were up all night. May Allah accept it from us and make us those who witnessed and benefit from Laylatul Qadr. But you can wake up a little before Fajr, pray some extra rak'ahs then, but you want to use the nights as best as you can. We live in a situation where our schedules are not necessarily as such that it's conducive necessarily for where and how we can wake up at two in the morning and then get up for work. But you do what you have capacity to do. So if you can pray to Hajjud, on Thursday night going into Friday morning on the day of Juma, then do it. If you can't, try to do it on a Saturday. Try to do it like once a month. Try to do it in some capacity. But don't do it because it's an obligation, because it's not an obligation. Do it because there is unique baraka, there is unique blessings in the nights. The Prophet Sallallahu would get permission from his wife to go and stand with Allah in the late hours of the night. And she would say, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that when everybody went to be with the ones that they loved, the Prophet went to be with Allah. And it gave him now that tenderness, that softness, right? It's part of the initial revelations. The first revelation that comes, Iqra read, is definitive. That's what everybody says was the first revelation. Revelation number two or three that came down is a difference of opinion. Ya ayyuhal muzammil qum al-layla ila qalila or ya ayyuhal mudathir qum fa'anthir. So ya ayyuhal mudathir qum fa'anthir that oh mudathir stand and warn people. Meaning in the day, use the day to act and do what you got to get done. Ya ayyuhal muzammil qum al-layla ila qalila that o oh, muzammil stand in the night even just a little and so it's giving now a formula first get some knowledge right and may Allah protect us from being those who have a thought opinion or idea on everything especially the things that we have no idea what we're talking about man it's better to be silent and in our tradition silence becomes an opening to wisdom Knowledge is the first step before you talk. And now whether prayer at night or speaking and doing is step two or three, it creates a cycle. 
gain knowledge, use the nights to soften your heart, use the day to deal with whatever is coming at you, and then there's self-care built into the exhaustion. It's an outlet. It's meant to be a means of softening. It's a spiritual exercise though, right? It's not gonna be just every night feels like the 27th night of Ramadan. Some nights are not, but as you get stronger and more situated in it, you're going to feel it in a different way. There's some spiritual masters of our tradition, may Allah be pleased with them, who would say that I stood in the night for 20 years and then I enjoyed the night prayer for the 20 years after meaning that it took them two decades of standing in the night to then get to a place where they tasted the sweetness of it. There's shiuch that said in our spiritual tradition that if the people of Jannah feel what we feel when we stand in the night in prayer, they must be so pleased. But there was just openings and illuminations. So use the nights. Add them into your routine, your spiritual routine. فَأَتْلِ qiyam, he says. And it goes back to the heart. It's a softener of the heart. He says then after, وَإِذَا وَجَدْتَ قَسَاوَةً That if you still find a hardness of your heart, فَذَرِ الْحَرَامِ Then refrain from that which is religiously impermissible. Now this becomes pretty tricky because a lot of us, we grow up only hearing halal, haram, 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 more haram than anything, and that everything suddenly that we do is haram. Ours is a book that has obligations and prohibitions, but that's not all that it has. But it still nonetheless has prohibitions. And those prohibitions were taught that if we engage in them, they then render a dark spot on our heart. May Allah protect us from it. And where and how the haram impacts us is not now just the eating of swine and the drinking of alcohol or the committing of zina, but gossip is haram, lying is haram, backbiting is haram, abuse is haram, domestic violence is haram, racism is crazy haram. And our Prophet Sallallahu when he had companions that struggled with the haram, he walked with them with compassion, with mercy. And you got to walk sometimes with others in that way. Because a lot of us don't turn to haram because we're bad people. A lot of us turn to haram because there's an absence of community support that we need. And we don't know where else to go. So we numb what is there to deal with the realities of life that are heavy for us. Ya Rasulullah, I committed zina. Ya Rasulullah, I drank alcohol. Ya Rasulullah, I kissed a woman I wasn't supposed to. They're not confessing to him, but they know that he's going to walk with them in their struggle. But there's some harams that happen that the Prophet got angry about. There's a companion that's abusing a boy. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is behind this man. And as he's doing it, the man says, I heard a voice behind me that says, Allah has more dominion over you than you do over this child. And I turned around and I saw that it was the messenger of God. And I said to him, as I saw anger apparent on his face, that Ya Rasulullah, he is free from this. And the Prophet said to him, good, had you not done so, you would have burned in the fire like a flaming coal. Abuse is not allowed. The Prophet's wife says of him, Lam yadrib Rasulullahi imra'atan wala ghulaman wala waladan qat, that the Messenger of God never struck a woman or a servant or a child ever. Bilal radiallahu an and Abu Dar of the Ghaffar tribe radiallahu an, they are going back and forth one day and emotions are escalating and all of a sudden Abu Dar, he calls Bilal the son of a black woman in a derogatory way. And what's crazy about this is Abu Dar himself is black. He's a black Arab. So essentially what he's saying to Bilal, you're an African, as if there's something wrong with that. And when he hears himself say it, he becomes quiet and they're both quiet. And when the prophet hears it, he gets angry. And he says to them that all of us are the children of a black woman. 
referring to Hajar, peace be upon her. But he gets angry at certain types of racisms, certain types of haram, not certain types of racism, sorry, all types of racism, but certain types of haram. So you got to be gentle with the people who struggle. You don't need to be the Sharia police that makes people feel as if they don't have a place with God. But the things that you want to speak out against, speak out against inequity, speak out against oppression. Don't ever validate your own racism and definitely don't validate any arrogance that comes from you. It's the worst root of racism and haram. Ibn Atta'illah, rahimahullah, in his hikam, he says an aphorism, paraphrased essentially, that if you do not believe, if you believe that you are not arrogant, then you likely are. And so you want to be mindful of the way shaitan strategies come upon you. But get into check a growth mindset. And one of the things that's helpful in being able to take on areas of improvement is to one, do it strategically. You're not going to be able to just go cold turkey on everything, but you try your best and you get up and try again and try again. That's what spirituality is about in Islam, mujahida, struggle. And you keep trying. That's all God wants from you. But you also understand who's the company that you keep. Who are the people that are uplifting you? Who are the people that also are keeping you accountable? And a part of what makes it helpful is to acknowledge the beauty that comes from you, the good that comes from you. And that becomes harder sometimes because we see ourselves quite often in self-deprecating ways. Confidence is about recognizing your God-given talents and skills. It's a form of gratitude. Just like saying thank you to someone, you thank Allah by using what he gave you in a way that's pleasing to him. And in order to do well with your skills, you have to acknowledge what is good about you in the first place. And that becomes really tough for a lot of us. If I ask you to tell me five things about you that are good, I would assume that many of you would not be able to do it. Where and how you relate now to confidence is that it allows for you to see what you do well, your strengths as well as your non-strengths. Arrogance has us just see what is wrong with everything around us. So if you're the type of person when somebody did something good, you try to tear them down or mock it or look for a reason to just dismiss it, there's a problem and you should look in your heart. If it's hard for you to celebrate people's achievements with them or be happy with their successes, then you should look into your heart. You wanna be in a place though where you can see your own beauty and be kind to yourself so that you can in turn be kind to others. And then just strive to grow even where it's gradual. You move forward. Fadhar al-Haram, the third advice he says, refrain from the Haram. When you come out of Ramadan, the shayateen, they're not chained anymore, man. And those thoughts are going to come. Oh, you don't need to pray Maghrib right now. After you prayed it right on its time every single day for a month, and it was the only time in the year that you were telling everybody, hey, it's time right now for us to break fast. You don't need to pick up the Quran anymore. No, yes, you do. It's good for you. Don't leave it behind. Fulfill the fara'id, stay away from the haram, and just go and try your best. And if you get down, get back up, because Allah is still there with you, and He is always there with you. And He loves you, not just because of who you are, but God loves us because of who He is, Azzawajal. He is Al-Wadud, the source of an unconditional love, and the perfection of His love, His mawadda, which is a very particular kind of love, it's a love that's not just spoken, it's never hidden, but it is always apparent and manifest in action, and it's unconditional. Allah's love is unconditional, and it accepts and embraces all of us in all of our diversity, as well as with each of our imperfections. And so what is being hard to accept is not that God accepts us because He does. Sometimes we're our biggest obstacle in our growth. 
because we know everything that we've done. And sometimes it's hard for us to forgive ourselves, but there is nothing that you can do that is greater than Allah's mercy and his love. And you want to be able to let the presence of that move you forward and strive to go wherever you are as best as you can. He then says, fourthly, that if you still find a hardness of your heart, الأرحام, then establish the bonds of kinship. There's not a prophet that we're taught about in our book that it didn't have a problem with family. Adam السلام, has a son that kills the other son. Yusuf السلام, is thrown into a well by his brothers. His father, Yaqub السلام, cries so much as a result he goes blind. Ibrahim السلام, is catapulted into a fire by his father and his town people. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has uncles that mistreat him. So we want to work in the prism of reality. No one is saying that you have to be accepting of abusive behavior. May Allah protect us from it. You got to understand that family can be tough. And Allah is the one that decided who our families are. And of the most circumstances that come into my office, which is a lot, a lot of people want to talk about a lot of things all the time. And that's okay. I'm happy to listen wherever you have things that you're carrying within you. A generalization I'm comfortable making is the gross majority. And I see people who have wellness issues, wrestling with grief, homelessness, job security, abuses of all kind, depression, anxiety disorders, borderline personalities, schizophrenia, people who have been evicted from their homes, all different kinds of things. Most of what the challenge comes from is from family. People have a lot of pain that they carry because of familial relationships. Fasil al-Arham, that I am in a place where I seek to establish these bonds of kinship. What's interesting is the word kindness is rooted in the word kin. And where and how we have parameters that are about acting justly with others and not demanding justice for ourselves alone. And so just think, you got hurt in your heart. Forgiveness is not for the one being forgiven. Forgiveness in large part is for the forgiver. And you go at a pace that makes sense for you. It's hard. It's hard. And it's okay to say it's hard. But where you go now is a process of ending indignation, resentment, and bitterness. And the vehicle that you traverse to get from a place of anger to a place of calm, a place of agitation to a place of tranquility, a place of conflict to a place of contentment, the bridge that's there is forgiveness. And the starter and ending point is both the same person. That's you. So Fasil al-Arham. You confront what it is that you carry because you don't have to carry toxicity in your heart. You don't have to carry pain and burdensome things in your heart. And if you have hurt somebody, make sure that you apologize. You go and you say sorry. The other day I was talking to my daughter and my son. They're eight and five. My daughter, she told me that she did something that her brother said she did. And I said, why would you do this? And I started to talk to her in a way that was disciplining. And then she said, actually, no, Baba, I was confused. I didn't do that. And I said to my son, what was it? And he said, yeah, she didn't do that. And so I turned to my eight-year-old and I said, Medina, I'm so sorry, baby. I was going off what you said, but that still doesn't make it okay. I'm proud of you that you did it in the way that you did. And I apologized to her. Because that's what my teacher, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has taught me to do. That apologies are not just for those that we somehow benefit from apologizing to them. Or apologies are not just from those who have no power over us or those who we have no accountability. You can say sorry to someone that you bumped into on the subway, but you can't say sorry to your spouse or to your kid. It's hard for you to say sorry to people you were in a relationship with that you hurt. There's a lot of people carrying a lot of pain. 
because others did not acknowledge the pain that they put into their hearts. And may Allah forgive us for any hurt that we've caused to anyone. Fasil al-Arham, he says that you establish the bonds of kinship. The Rahim, which is the connector of this construct, Sil al-Arham, the Rahim is the womb. It's in the mother. And it is a literal branch of Ar-Rahman, the Hadith says. But you gotta think, the first abode that God puts you in in this worldly existence is an abode of mercy, of Rahmah. And you're utilizing that now as the means of connection. Are there people in your life that you have anguish with? As you're moving forward with Ramadan, I want you to think for a moment, where will you be most vulnerable to shaitan and his whispers? Because he's going to get you where you are vulnerable, not where somebody else is vulnerable. And so this place of relationships, family ties, it can be hard for a lot of us. May Allah make it easy. You got to own it. Just because you're the patriarch or matriarch of a family, the elder, doesn't mean that suddenly you could do whatever you want to. Same as if you're a young person. You got to honor those rights as best as you can. And that's again barring situations of abuse. May Allah forgive us for any pain we cause to people. And then the last one, just in these last couple of minutes before Maghrib comes in here in New York City, he says, that if you still find hardness, then be gentle to the orphan. The specificity of it should not be lost on us. We have narrations in our tradition where the Prophet, he crosses his middle finger and index finger and says that the one who cares for an orphan will be like this with me in Jannah. May Allah make us those who are granted the company of the Prophet وسلم, in the highest levels of his paradise in the world beyond this one. But we find also in our tradition narrations that say the way that we look into the skies and the stars shine down upon us, the angels when they look into the world from the heavens, the homes that have orphans being cared for in them, they shine to the angels the way the stars shine to us. If you have the capacity to care for an orphan, care for an orphan. Adoption is not a problem in our religion. What you can't do is assume the natal identity of anyone. And this is there so that nobody usurps the inheritance of a young person. The way you have corruption in the adoption systems in many parts of the world, people take children in foster care so they can take the financial benefit from it. Our religion is protecting what that child is owed through their lineage, saying that you will always be the child of your parent so no one can come and usurp your belongings. So the specificity of it, look into it, think about it, talk to your significant other, your spouse. You are a single person, you can still adopt somebody, but you got to think consciously. And then the general aspect of it, engage in acts of kindness, gentleness, compassion towards those that the world has forgotten. Al Latif is one of the names of the divine, the gentle, the kind, the subtle. And so you want to do that in these last nights of Ramadan and going outside of Ramadan. And these five things, they are part of the hadith in so many ways that we can root them in as well as the Quran. But these counsels of the Noon al-Misri, you want to apply them to yourselves. Endure in fasting, he says. Stand into the night in prayer. Make your standing longer. Refrain from the haram. Re-establish the bonds of kinship and be gentle to the orphan. So just as we wrap up, I'm putting my email in the chat box on the Zoom. For those who you are on Clubhouse, you can reach out to me at kl442 at nyu.edu. Just a couple of quick announcements. Please do give to the various charity initiatives we're running through the IC. You can find a lot of those up on our email lists and social media. Make sure that you give your zakat al-fitr before Eid, and you can give that particularly at launchgood.com slash ICNYU Ramadan Relief, $12 per person in your family. It's supposed to be given before Eid so that it's given to people 
by Eid so they can celebrate Eid. It also serves as a compensation for any inadequacies that might have been in our month of Ramadan. So make sure you're doing that. We're running a campaign around domestic violence at launchgood.com slash end domestic violence. We're doing one for the Ida refugee camp in Palestine at launchgood.com slash Ida camp relief. And we're doing one for India and the COVID crisis there at launchgood.com slash ICNYU, the number four India. All together in charity, this community, mashallah, has raised close to $2 million. And I'm so proud of each one of you for everything that you've dug deep and given. If you can continue to give, continue to use the nights in prayer, continue to take from these remaining moments of Ramadan, and then don't think about what you're going to do without consciousness, but use some of these nights to say, what am I really going to move forward with? What am I celebrating on the day of Eid al-Fitr of what I achieved so I can make it concrete in my being and I'm not going to give it up for anything? Because if you're going to give up your heart for anything, make sure you give it up only for paradise because your heart is worth only Jannah and that's the only thing that you should be selling it for. Where you can keep us and our community and your du'as in these last nights, inshallah, would be appreciated. But may Allah bless you and your loved ones and accept from all of us everything that you have done thus far in this month of Ramadan. May he guide and bless us all. I'm going to not make a dua today just because we went a little bit past the time. So forgive me for that. Uh, but we do still have programs happening at the IC. Uh, and lastly, if you can make a contribution to the IC in these nights of Ramadan, it'd be appreciated. We rely fully on our community for our support of programs and operations. So whatever you can give, inshallah, uh, would go a long way to help us continue to do the work that we do. Barakallah fikum. I miss you all so much. And I'm making dua that Allah enables us to be with each other soon in physical presence. But you and your loved ones are in my prayers as always. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa billahi tawfiq. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. If you like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.